Howdy. Just so everyone knows, uh, we are recording these now, so we'll get them posted after. But I uh, just got that fired up, and I think it's working. Great. So. Yeah, it, it's showing me a recording button in the upper left. Cool. Awesome. Yep. How's everyone doing? Good today. Pretty awesome. I'm Wonderful. How are you doing uh, today? I'm not whacked out of my mind at the moment, so I think that's a plus. <laughs> off the meds early, yeah. Yeah, yeah. One, one cycle off. As soon as the call ends, I'm getting right back on. <laughs> I made it. I'm here. You can hear me. Yeah. 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 Can you? yeah. Yay. Hey, Joe. How's the oh. uh, puck puck Bruce going? Uh, I'm really liking it. Yeah. 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 It's a lot better than those mini remotes I used to have everywhere. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how how was it for you to transition from trigger to um to thumb? It's it's a little different, you know. Uh, when I first started writing, I had a Meepo uh, that was trigger, but or I mean um, thumb wheel. But when I switched to DIY, I went with the trigger, and I really liked it because uh, it's a little more controllable, especially with gloves for me. Um, but you know, with a high quality. Uh, wheel, it's actually quite nice. Yeah, yeah I switched I would, back I and agree. forth myself. Um, yeah. But I think if I if I was forced to choose one, I'd probably go with trigger, because I worry about my thumb with a carpal tunnel or something, at some point. So, but yeah, I can use both equally fine as well. I, I was using it's trigger. And it's, it's easy to hit on accident. That's all I was saying. Yeah. Very easy. Yeah, Tom, are, you gonna, are you are you going to interrupt introduce us? Oh, it's gone. Yeah, are we uh, ready to get started? It's four oh five. Yep, let's do it. All right, all right. Thanks everybody joining. We're gonna uh, keep to a, a loose agenda. So if anybody has any questions, definitely speak up. We're uh, wanting to uh, have a definite community uh, um, interaction here. So we've got uh, quite a few people on the. Uh, on I slash free skate team across the board and across the world here today. So everything from a, a afternoon here uh, or, or even early afternoon for, for Andrew to a Sunday morning for, for Bill and uh, middle of the night, I guess, for Zach, I'm, I'm guessing. I don't yes, know. Sir. But I uh, uh, appreciate you joining. So we're going to uh, kick off probably with just an introduction with uh, some of the key players, I guess. So starting with uh, probably our favorite person in the room here is uh, Renee. In my bottom right. Oh, that was going to be Andrew. Hi. Whoop, whoop. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm coding most of the things and making shit happen. So if you like features and want something, just let me know and we'll try to work it in. And, and sleeping like three track. hours a day. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're super thankful. And uh, I guess probably should go with the, uh, with the head boss, Andrew. Definitely. I didn't catch that. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm and I am Andrew Dresner. Uh, Renee is my main partner in crime. She and I have been working together uh, doing and building robotics related things for a good number of years now. So this is our, uh, like I think our third adventure, major adventure or something. Um, but the first one that is kind of like our, uh, you know, our first truly owned project that just started with the two of us and and went from there as opposed to going and working for the corporate overlords. And it's going far into the future also. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll say I'm, I'm, a, I'm Bill Gordon, and uh, I'm a, a small part of DRI as well as Freeskate, and uh, I basically make the coffee and clean the toilets. Someone has got to do it. <laughs> Part of the welcome wagon. There you go. Yeah. All right. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Or, or Sean or someone. Keeps keep the ball rolling. I'm gonna start I'm gonna start pointing people out. Zach, quick introduction. Uh, go. I'm Zach. Uh, I, I don't really know what I do here. I, I like to think that I keep some humor, but Debatable, up for debate. So, yeah, that, that's it. Thanks Fair for joining us, Zach. 
Tom? Yep. Tom, I'm here just as a hangers honor and uh, and bringing a uh, dumb dumb viewpoint on things as a just a common guy. So uh, enjoying to hang out, but uh, uh, definitely excited for some things that are going to be coming up this year. So um, I think uh, maybe Lynn, are you on here still? Oh uh, yeah. So this is um, Wayne Dagner or Dan Wagner, whichever uh, floats your boat. Um, Tom and I are in competition for the dumbest one in the room. Depends on the topic, but. Uh, I think mostly my engagement is is with the the back office stuff and trying to help keep the forum going and and some technical things and um, some technical discussions from here or there. I, I know a few things about electricity and ones and zeros, so you know I I do what I can to help out. Cool. It brings I us see, to the uh, bottom of the list. Yeah. No, I see uh, Mooch here in my uh, in my list. How you doing? Can you hear me, Mooch? Yes, but it takes like five seconds for any button to respond to anything. So apologize for that. Hey, yes, I do. Hey, it's, welcome. It's the world of technology. That's called lag. It's something like SAG, but slightly different. Yeah. I have both. <laughs> like, I, I have both. I get lag and SAG, so it works out. Yeah. Come with hey, uh, hey, hey, Kevin. Yes, sir. How you doing? Good morning. Um, yeah, I had my uh, work calendar on it. I didn't realize it auto updated to my personal. I downloaded that app. Um, good morning, guys. Evening. Thanks for uh, putting this together. Um, I'm just. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining. How are you doing? All right. So yeah, is that wanna... uh, Chris Becker, right? Yeah, I'll introduce myself. Okay. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm, right. I'm sort of. I feel like I'm really new to this still, so I'm just here to learn. Thanks for having me. Me too. Welcome. Yeah, Chris is uh, Chris is a local rider that uh, bumped into with the Portland eboarding crew uh, out here. So, yeah, and the more time I spend with these guys, the more I want to get my hands on it. So this is great. <laughs> well, you you've got a Robogachi in hand now, so start now. The fun starts. And I see Fast is here. How you doing? Okay, I'm Fast. Uh, I sometimes break shit. I sometimes get deeply involved in debugging stuff for people. And I sometimes space out and disappear for a bit. So I try and help my best. I love the idea of this platform of advanced control systems and all of the ideas that has been being around this project. So I keep hoping that will be able to add value. Cool. Andrew, have you introduced yourself? Andrew Sands, have you introduced yourself yet? No. Andrew did himself after Renee, right? Oh, did he? Okay, sorry. This Andrew, there's two of us. Uh, uh, there's actually three. There is actually three. We have a third. Yeah, there's uh, Mr. Sands and uh, Mr. Varner. I hope I'm oh, yeah, that yeah, right. right. So we want to take our respective turns here. And I see I see Mr. Felsen is with us. Fuck you, Bill. <laughs> Definitely him. There's no doubt at all, guys. It's definitely him. I had to get the cock <laughs> out of my mouth. <laughs> well, I hope you'll let me put it back in when we're finished. Please do. All right. Let's so uh, is everybody, uh, I think everybody's tagged in at this point, right? I think we got, we got Shua. We got a rep. We got Quinn. We got Oliver. We got Killo. Anybody who has to speak up and just say hi. 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 Hey, this is the wonderful voice. I want to take a second and uh, point out Riley's lack of hair. <laughs> You're rocking the uh, look. Oh, yeah, you saved it. I've been trying to come up with a joke to respond to your question about it for the last five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, glad everybody's here. We're going to probably kick it off with just a, a kind of a summary and update on where we're with Robogachi. I know quite a few of you in the room have, have uh, been given the beta testing and uh, and uh, there's some exciting things I think right around the corner that I've had a uh, sneak preview of. So I'll uh, kick it over to, to Andrew and probably a lot of uh, input from Renee. Yeah, um, Renee has been hard at work pushing the mobile app forward. Um, quite honestly, the Freescape mobile app is one of those things where like we didn't even know how big of a project it would be until we were in the middle of it um it has definitely grown way beyond what 
we had originally planned on doing. Um, funny enough, when we first started this, the game plan was to reskin Vesk Tool Mobile and just <laughs> roll with that because we just didn't want to get pulled into basically the massive burden of development that is a scratch built app, right? Um, Renee and Eric actually went through the trouble of even like reskinning it and starting that whole process. And then we threw that entire thing off to the side and started a ground up scratch written effort. So that was definitely a pretty major change early on that really, uh, that really made, uh, you know, changes towards our, our roadmap goals. Um, it was a, it was a big support burden. Renee has probably put in easily 1200 plus hours already <laughs> on this, if not more, um, you know, building out the Freescape mobile app. So with that said, we are rapidly approaching a public release. Um, Renee just pushed up uh, 0.90 and we have 0.10 uh, right around the corner. Uh, Renee, did you want to talk about that a little, what you've added in the latest release? Uh, so far, the primary focus has been um, the app configuration, which is essentially like your input configuration for your remote. So anything in app config, what we're kind of doing is currently moving to um, a UR or a PPM configuration, uh, just kind of like simplify the amount of options that are presented to you in the mobile app. So, uh, you know, we can calibrate, you can set your dead band, your ramp times, uh, throttle curves, uh, anything that you could do in best tool related to app config for PPM and UR, we now have in, in Freescape. So you can do it on the road, iOS, Android, whatever you need. Um, yeah, that's, it's a pretty big lift. Uh, and there's actually a lot more tied to it. You know, we're parsing the data structure to, you know, to like support balance devices. Um, so I, I, it's, it's a huge lift if we were ever going to do something like that or when we do, we just have it on the list for now, but yeah, um, there's, there's a lot there and, uh, I'm just trying to simplify it to, you know, so that it's just as few clicks as or taps as possible, you know, to get through the tasks and, and not be too overwhelming. Uh, let's see if I have anything else. Uh, the actually, you know what? It's worth talking about uh, point or the the most recent release actually uh, point nine zero that you just dropped because for those who haven't updated or haven't heard, um, one of the primary bottlenecks early on is just BLE transfer times are not great. Um, so Renee put in a considerable amount of work to rework not only the storage. Uh, on the Robogachi and how it's stored, but the actual transfer protocol as well. Uh, what would you guesstimate the increase was in transfer time? Um, it was somewhere around 60% faster. Right. Um, on, primarily testing on Android. It depends on which mobile device you're on, what your maximum transmission unit is, but yeah it's quite a bit faster quite a bit smaller so uh you'll get you can store more data on your device and it'll get to your mobile device a lot quicker um there's just a tiny bit of post processing now you'll see it says uh unpacking data after it's received you know uh it has to be a pretty long log like a you know an hour or so of data and uh but that you know it's just a couple of seconds of processing on your phone which is a lot better than waiting for bluetooth plus you have sync time remaining so uh, I'd like to improve that right now. It just estimates for the current file, but you know, you might have five logs on there. So it'd be neat to see the estimated time remaining for your current file plus all of the files. Um, what else did we get in there? And Renee, uh, how many rides do you guys um, guess you can actually take without even uploading to your phone? Uh, um, I don't, say that, say if, if you, how many hour long rides do you feel you might be able to get away with before syncing with your phone? I don't remember the numbers on that. I uh, think it was, honestly, the last time we calculated it was probably before the storage refactoring. Uh, and we were at like 70 hours. 
Yeah. Okay, that's what that's what I remember. Yeah. 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 That's that's two good rides for me. So that's great. <laughs> yeah, I uh, definitely definitely noticed an increase in time uh, if, or decrease in the t amount of time, uh, and uh, definitely appreciated that, Renee, and excited for the, the couple of features. Seeing the picture of the throttle curve was pretty exciting to be uh, to know that I'm going to have that access to that mid ride is uh, pretty exciting, and uh, I'm excited for the for the rest of the group. Um, are you guys at the point that you will talk about? We've been doing some review the last couple of days, Andrew. Can you, are you able to talk about the uh, the uh, time frame on the on the web portion? Yeah, we can talk a little bit about that. There's not really a time frame right now because we're we're still kind of really building out the the skeleton of everything. Uh, we. There was a VESC data log analyzer web tool that somebody had built a while back. They shut down the project because they were trying to get people to pay them. Otherwise, they didn't want to. They didn't want to host it or something like that. And then a good Samaritan showed up and went, ah, "I like that. I'll just build my own and open source it." And so they did. Uh, we talked to the gentleman that had open sourced his project, said, would you mind if we tapped this for FreeSkate? It looks like a great starting point. Um, and he said, sure, go nuts. And so we have right now, uh, it's not currently functional with the uh, most recent firmware updates to the Robogachi, but we have an update coming to it. But it's upload.freeskate.dev pulls it up. And this is essentially a, a web browser log analyzation tool uh, that gives you quite a bit more control. And you can see quite a bit more granularity of data in it. Uh, we were just using it to play uh, eSkate CSI on, uh, on Bill's uh, misfortunate event. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just the other evening and we're able to determine quite a bit from that. Um, so, I, yeah. I had a question um, about the, the when, about the amount of storage that you could handle without uploading. And it's what's the, what's the data creation rate per like period of time or at, like active time at data creation rate or something. It's it kind of depend on how much you're doing or. No, it's, it depends upon the logging rate that's configured because the Robogachi can be configured to only log one ESC, multiple ESCs over CAN, and then there's also a data rate attached to that. So it's all going to be based on that. Should I be able to estimate it? Right. It's yeah, I, I don't know off, I don't know the number offhand. Um, Renee, are you going to calculate that now, or should we should we table it? <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to make a note. Yeah, she's <laughs> all right. I was uh, going to ask, do, do we do we want to talk about where the um, the web app actually can lead, or leave that leave it at that for now? Yeah, no, that's 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 a decent tie-in. So we we're approaching logging from two distinct models right now. Um, Right now, with the Robogachi with BLE uh, transfers, that's what we're considering our local data logging mod, uh, model. And so you have your board, you transfer locally to your app, you have your files locally there. The bridge from there will be an upload function to FDLA. Um, and then you kind of have the best of both worlds. The next step and one of the things we'll talk about this a little bit more moving forward with the freeskate core uh we're moving towards an online basically sort of a seamless upload model where when you plug into charge you have wi-fi credentials that are already built into your board and it auto updates the data services directly so it completely cuts the need to sync and transfer over an app and then upload out of the equation. And then from there, the app can pull from web data services and display your logs that way, as well as anything local. So that's sort of our next step transition 
as, but we do want to still have both modes because we you know realize some users may not want Wi-Fi upload or data services and things like that and still having local uh, logging and and without the requirement or prerequisite for data services is still going to be a valuable thing is there um sorry real quick in, in the roadmap is there ever going to be like a live sharing so if you got a group of friends and you got someone tagging behind that's late um any integration with gps and pulling that data through your phones uh phones data we, you know that's so that's essentially what our dream goal is i i call it almost a moonshot right now because it is just Renee and I and we are building out from the skeleton up. That is exactly what we're aiming towards though. And that's one of the reasons why we want these data services. A, I would even say if we're forecasting towards the future, quicker and quicker we're getting cheap cellular data services for devices. So we have things like NB-IoT, Cat1M, even 5G is going to drop dramatically in price. So it wouldn't be a far stretch to eventually add data services directly to the board. And that's exactly what our core module sort of serves. And I think with that, that might actually be a good transition to sort of talk about core and the remote. Um, the, the status of the remote and the FreeSkate core receiver project uh, design is pretty much done. We are in beta hardware procuring mode. So uh, as soon as we get beta hardware in, uh, we're going to start firing up a minimum viable product for our firmware and get to testing on that. Um, we already have a significant head start because we're basing everything off of the original OSRR firmware. It's sort of a leaping point. Um, it's so we're, we're basically not starting from scratch. We're starting from a well-proven out code base already with our remotes. Um, hardware design is, I would call it 99% done. I might need to make a few adjustments here and there after we get the first batch of beta hardware in. But aside from that, it's pretty like well fleshed out and productized at this point. Now, the FreeSkate core is running an ESP32 MCU. This is a dual core, 240 megahertz risk-based microcontroller. Uh, it has Wi-Fi integrated as well as 16 megs of flash. That is all in a $2.99 package, which is freaking incredible. Like, yeah. it blows me away that we have that sort of CPU and a self-contained module for that cheap. But 2021 is the future. So um, the ESP32 is going to serve as our primary dedicated controller. And this is the major divergence that we're taking away from the VESC project. The VESC project uses a ESC as a primary controller as well as a motor controller. So your primary ESC drops out, faults, anything like that. Your radio comms are gone. You're, you're dead in the water, basically. It's a single point of failure. Um, we are taking a page out of the drone UAV robotics book and going with a dedicated primary controller. Um, all of the ESCs will run in a secondary slave CAN bus mode and simply take uh, motor data and telemetry commands from a primary controller whose only job is it to take an input from your controller and then monitor the status of the ESCs outside of those ESCs? So, so the difference is kind of like um, if your engine shut off in your car and then your dashboard all turned off also just because the engine stopped running? Correct. You, We could potentially even have an ESC go out and still and understand that we have an ESC out and compensate for that as a result. Like, because the controller architecture exists outside of the ESCs, the ESCs become dumb motor controllers as they should be. So um, this not only increases safety and sort of system overall resilience, but it's just the right way to do it. Um, it's also going to give us quite a bit more command over how we want our systems comms architectures to work. And it sets us up to transition for when we do 
dive into our own novel ESC hardware design. So right now, our next goals immediately on the table are getting our remote and core hardware stood up. Um, the primary is getting remote functionality. The steps beyond that will be Wi-Fi connectivity. And from there, that prove, or that gives us our first major direct bridge from board to our data services. Now, I will say this, we're not gonna talk too much about it because I don't want to hype something that does not exist, but our first end goal with data services is a leaderboard, meaning you users will have a profile, you will have boards in your dashboard or your garage, and you will track historical mileage, top speeds, all of your logs in one space there. And then we'll have the ability to filter uh, logs that are submitted to the leaderboards by region and things like that. So you could vary and also might be a cool way of finding other riders in the area and things like that. We could oh, eventually yeah. move towards that. Um, but the, the, the idea and the concept is to create more of a social riding structure with this. And so Kevin, you brought up, you know, uh, things like live GPS map on group rides. We'd absolutely love that. That's a pretty long leap to get there, but that's definitely the general direction we're aiming. Um, the easiest sort of hello world MVP sort of like, okay, we have something functional. We have something that's useful to the community, I feel is like a leaderboard. And so that's that's what we're going to aim at. And it's gonna be basic and bare bones and it's gonna take a while to get there. But I feel that that at least gives somebody, so, it gives all of us sort of like a way of interacting and sort of contributing to a you know bigger online community that's a bit more interactive. Real quick, just for a wide app dietitian, um, can, can a non-FreeSkate customer uh, just download an app just to view a free skate customer, someone who has the actual module to gain more access to more people more times. If say they're on an Onyx bike or something, that's not best. Yeah, I mean, ideally, I, I I would like to support more than just Vesk. Like this is supposed to be Vesk agnostic ultimately, and that that's honestly the primary controller architecture plays very well towards that. So that that is sort of the intention there. Uh, one second. I think Andrea had a question he wanted to ask. Yeah. He had, he had a raised hand. Go ahead, Andrea. Yeah, it's quickly. So that means that we would love to create uh, um, social profiles uh, or profiles for users on the cloud that they are accessible through different devices mm -hmm. and where all the information is stored, right? Because yeah. otherwise you're going to have a device that like loses memory, like if the you break your phone mm -hmm. and everything. Oh yeah, this will, this will have centralized data services for all of this. Yeah. Yeah, so that's an extra layer. Yeah, that's, I'm dealing with we, that currently with my stuff and it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> right, right. No, no, no. We, this would be, we would likely have to even use the app as a user authentication portal to sort of connect your hardware to your app anyway, or to your profile anyway. So Correct. funny enough, yeah. that we've actually <laughs> developed a system like this professionally before uh, with, it was a, uh, basically an edge compute, renewable energy. I, I'm not even going to call it a blockchain platform, even though it could technically run it, but we've, we've done something similar to this with online data services and OTA updates and the ability to query in data and logs globally back to central places. So we've actually architected and built out systems like this prior. This is not our first mm -hmm. attempt at something like this. Yeah, that is not right. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I have a small question. Uh, yeah. In this grand vision of uh, what you what uh, Kevin's idea of having this map for real time updates during a group ride, would there be a GSM module in our board that would connect to, I guess, data yeah. servers, or would it always be through the phone? And then I, I 
I feel like phone might have to be the initial bridge just because it makes sense and everybody already has it right there and it's not an additional chunk of hardware. With that said, it's also one of those things where our primary goal is to put this tech into the boards as an embedded system because I don't want the phone requirement. Really, the phone or the laptop should be a portal into the services we're providing. It shouldn't be a requirement to ever operate your board. Yeah, because I was thinking that if you have your phone with you anyway, then you don't actually even need anything in the board for the GPS map idea. For the for GPS, example. no, you yeah. would not. But on the same accord, I mean, that that's also a good point, though, because that might be early on, we may very well just have mobile users that, that are an entry on there but they're never going to get quite the same granularity of data and logging as somebody with a full data logger solution. So maybe they wouldn't be ranked, but they could still participate, for example. And that's it. <laughs> What's that? Would it be possible to put the GPS uh, onto a display like a Dave GA, Dave Ga? Yeah, that was one of our early ideas but we scrapped it only because we wanted the GPS out then and now, and we didn't want to delay Robogachi anymore. But yeah. I mean, screens are so cheap now. We're already running power up there. It, it would make a lot of sense to at least add it as a socket on it. So we will very likely be looking at that. It was originally called, not the GPS module, it was called a Navcom because it was supposed to be a little display GPS all in one external unit. Um, when I swing back around and do that post beta, we'll likely add an option like that. Um, we were, I mean, Renee and I went back and forth because we were pissed we had to give up an RGB uh, indicator on the GPS. <laughs> and because we didn't want to give that up, but we were just trying to get something moving forward so that we could get beta started. Um, so yeah, definitely. I think that's I think that's in the cards. Um, I've even talked to Jan uh, about his uh, display interface and the code that runs on the day Vega, and you know, to see if there was something we could potentially work out with the open source portion of it or something like that. But on the same accord, we already have our own display code that runs well, like with the OSRR and stuff like that. So it's not a huge. Uh, not a huge leap to implement. Yeah, I do. I do like the uh, you, know, you mentioned before that you don't want people riding skateboards looking at their phones, and uh, that that hits home for me because I think any kind of distraction is a really bad idea. I mean, realistically, we have to consider e-skate, especially some of these bigger ones, are like motorcycle level dangerous, and you wouldn't pull your phone out on a motorcycle either. So, like, yep. that's, I'm trying to be very responsible. It's like you're driving a vehicle; you're not supposed to have your phone out anyway. So that's why why we're focused on that hands-free approach to our design here. Yep. Yeah, personally, yeah, I don't even look down and mount the phone yeah. off of my shoulder and put it in closer view than a Dave GA. I'd actually consider that safer. In other words, my arm is free. If I pull out a phone and hold it out here and see it, I can see that better than trying to stare down at a Dave GA. So I think those are weird boundaries to talk about. I, you know, and that's that's one of the exact points that we brought up and one of the reasons we didn't go forward with the screen on there because I think it's a distraction too. Honestly, if I had budget and engineers, I'd go, let's build a small heads up display or something like that. You can stick on a helmet and just glance down at if you need to know battery and or speed. Like, and that's it, like keep it dead simple. I would rather approach it with integrated hardware. I'm a hardware guy though, so it's always going to be my my go-to solution. But I would rather go with wearables or helmet mounted HUDs or things like that than screens that are far away. The other thing is, uh, the other reason we ditched the idea of the screen on the uh, GPS is we have a screen on our remote. So if you really want to check, it's right there. 
And so we didn't want to add it there as well and just have another redundant solution. You know, if you oh, think smartwatch app, uh, they've already, <laughs> Renee has already worked on it. Renee, I don't know if you can see the chat. Oh, I guess not. Oh, it's not scrolling. That's what's happening. It just seemed like it died out, but no, it has been going on and on. Um, yeah, we have, we have an iOS or a Apple Watch app that connects directly to the skateboard. So it doesn't need your phone because, you know, um, it seemed like the way to do it. Uh, we have one issue preventing us from releasing that and we don't have anything for Android yet, but it could, it could happen just with time. Um, oh yeah, I was thinking it would be really neat if you could find your friend on your remote with your display. That'd be really fun. Future goals. Yeah, what yep. I was thinking is that it would have the directions and then it would calculate like left, right directions for to find your friends as if they're a, yeah. Yeah, like a radar or something. Oh no, I meant just, just like regular Google Maps, like go straight, go left, just to find your friends. Okay. I feel like at that point you should like, <laughs> we'd be reinventing the wheel. We'd be reinventing Google Maps. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that, this, that's a far don't ignore me, though. I get crazy. <laughs> uh, I mean, but that, that does bring up a point though. And like with the remote, we have not only a screen, we have the same 90 decibel buzzer that we have on the Robogachi in the remote. And then we also have a haptic driver. So in, a, in addition to having RGB light control, if something goes wrong and you get a fault, we can flash red and chirp angrily at you at your remote and also buzz your uh, haptics to make you aware of that. And that's one of the things is like, you could also apply the same thing when it comes to temperature thresholds. So you start flashing orange if your motors or your ESC is starting to get warm or you start getting a bit of a in your remote to know, you know, so that you have a sort of immediate feedback from something with your board that you wouldn't be able to know otherwise without looking at a screen. So that is the other thing. We're trying to move away from screens and pulling your eyes away from the road as much as possible, which is why the remote will first and foremost be haptic audio and very simple display because we're, we're trying to keep eyes on the road. I'm a I'm a big fan taken from the EUC world and their first beep, second beep, third beep, uh, third beep, yeah, you're going to yeah. die. And I'd like to see one of those at 94% duty cycle, et cetera. And I yeah. know you guys are surely already on top of that, but yeah, that's, 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 that's what the remote, remote can, that's what the remote can notify yeah. well on. And that's is, both one of the reasons we want to. Is there an accelerometer chip inside the remote? Uh, if in case there's a 20 G knock, um, it will notify next it can, or just for whatever reasons, just to know how hard you ate shit. You know, there isn't, but that's a really good suggestion. Um, it's It's been something we've thought about because the board itself uh, is getting a IMU on the core, probably on the next rev, if I can fit it. It didn't yep. get it on this one. Um, but it's not a bad idea, and they're dirt cheap these days. Yeah, so it, it gives us, you know, some extra data there. I don't know if I want to, like do something, I remember when like Trampa claimed they had, what was it, some like drop protection built in or something or like, or, like the remote disables itself. If you walk away from the board, we're like, you That's mean it good. drops out in connection? Yeah. Like, <laughs> but yeah, they. I think there was some claim that the IMU in it could detect a drop and it would do, but I looked at the code and there was no such anything, so. It's, it's more like one of the things, if you build it, someone will find a use for it, and you'll be like, oh, that's a really genius idea. If it's only right. that the build material is $1.60. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kevin, Kevin wants that leaderboard for Hardest Falls. Ooh. I don't know if I want to put... See, for the same reason, I would be... I would be hesitant to put a top speed leaderboard. Yep, it's really bad for the one-wheel community. It makes a lot of people go faster than they should. 
I, I, I would be real. I'd be like, mm, no, I, th I that's, that's, that's why the video realm. Those are YouTube uh, videos, not leaderboards. <coughs> yep, I, I agree. I back that decision. I, in the cycling community, it's definitely uh, some bad accidents because of, of we were all racing Strava, Strava goals, right? And there's yeah. been all kinds of bad shit that's gone I down. Feel like, I feel like odometer, you know, basically you submit a log and it has GPS on it because otherwise people could just run up their odometer on the bench. But so, like, it, it requires a GPS log to submit to the leaderboards. But if we just track mileage, that's a fun, easy thing that is open and accessible. Anybody can do it. Anybody can participate. And it's not like it, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So I, I think and it's, and it's not really dick measuring. It's just kind of more community based. Yeah. 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 And nobody's going to access that record and uh, hold me liable in some sort of criminal case. Uh, it's also uh, a notion of like you know achievements where you don't have to compete online but you can you know per mm -hmm. different boards that you have you know oh you hit a hundred miles a thousand miles etc yeah and I, I, I feel like your your personal historical top speed on your board because the way i i envision that is you have a profile and you have your garage and you have your boards listed and then on those achievement badges for you know this board has a thousand miles this board has two thousand miles this board's top speed was you know 42 miles an hour those type of i it's definitely taken a page from the xbox gamification book but i'll shamelessly borrow from that because it's fun um, and that, that is sort of what we want to do is create an incentive that you're building your own collection and, and the people that enjoy that sort of gamification and, and tracking of their stats, it, it could eventually become like Fitbit for your skateboard. You know? So why not give this to OEMs like LaCroix and their extreme fanboy base? Um, because we need to build it first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I know I I already have OEMs that want this, Great. so it's it's a matter of building because you can't really sell something that doesn't exist unless yeah, they'll sell themselves. That's what will happen. Okay. Um, can we hire some fiber guys to take some load off of you? I don't think we're at a point where we can outsource it right now because there's still too much plumbing. But like one of the things that we're that's uh, slated for this year would be a UI overhaul um, and bringing in somebody with uh, experience and background in that. Um, it's, it's one of those tedious things that takes a lot of time. So, I mean, UI work is, is not easy. <laughs> Neither is mobile app. It's surprisingly. Yeah. Fun. I, I am so lucky because I do hardware and embedded and whatnot, and mobile is just a total unnecessary for me. So we would be we would be lost without Renee in this. <laughs> for sure. Right, is there are there any other uh, teases that you want to uh, throw out there, Andrew, or? Or nothing that you that's uh, far enough enough along to talk about. Oh no! Are you dabbing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I never. There we go. Uh, I, I thought you were taking mime classes again. Yeah, <laughs> that's what. I... <coughs> oh. Oh, shut up, Billy. Papa's doing drugs. Okay. Your joke was so good, he couldn't, he couldn't, couldn't even breathe. He was coughing because your joke was so funny. Um, I mean, I like, I try not to talk too much about stuff that isn't tangible. So you guys kind of know what the rest of our roadmap looks like. We have a BMS and an anti spark that already have a proven out schematic and design. I have compared notes with our lovely Charles, AKA Blasto. And he, so I've had a second set of EEIs on it. Um, the design is sound. Our anti-spark, honestly, we, Charles and I both ended up picking the same front end 
And so we came to the same exact solution on how to design it and just compared notes. He built it first. I checked his notes against mine and have a working design as a result. The BMS itself is also built around a uh, open reference design initially. Uh, we I made some changes to increase the balance current on it considerably. Uh, it had like a 15 milliamp balance current. It now has a 150 milliamp balance current. Um, so that's way higher than most of the uh, BMSs out there. Most of them cap out around 50 or so, 30, yeah. Um, so with that, uh, we're, we're basically trying to get the remote fully up beta launched hardware in hands, and then we will switch gears over to finish lining the BMS and the anti-spark. Um, remote. Andrew, do you want, or, sorry to interrupt you. Do you want to talk about the different versions of the remote or not yet? Uh, I mean, real quick, I, the big change is we're going to move forward with a trigger, uh, prototype in beta. So we are moving forward with that. Uh, I, I didn't want to put a raw thumb wheel assembly on it, but I figured out a way to make a pretty cheap, it costs about, I think $6 in parts and it builds a pretty nice trigger. So Hall or pot. What's that? Hall or pot. Oh, it's the same. It's the same one from CyberTech. I just okay. built a bearing oh. rein. I built a bearing reinforced trigger assembly around it, basically. Cool. So, um, my the idea there is even if you break it, you just replace the printed trigger part, and it protects the actual thumb wheel itself from damage. So, uh, I those we just need hardware. We need PCBs in. And then I can confidently finish out uh, featuring the inside of them, and then we'll we'll be rolling. Honestly, the remotes should, as soon as we get hardware in, the remote should go real quick. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Yep. So, uh, guys, I was going to mention out of transparency, one of the topics we wanted to touch on today was the. Uh, some some feedback on app, what you'd like to see on free skate logs, things like that. But I, I honestly think it, seeing what I've seen is that's just around the corner. I think we would probably be benefit us just to punt that for the next uh, um, free skate talk. Meaning that uh, I think once you see some of the web stuff, you're gonna um, a lot of your needs are gonna be sufficed there, and we'll be able to give some meaningful feedback when Renee actually has time to uh, dig into it. Um, Andrew, are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, right on. Um, hey, just for uh, eight seconds, I'm up to speed. When you're talking about web, are we talking about like a web uh, GUI similar to Vest Tool, like like drones use? <sighs> um, wait, well, Vest Tool and drones are very, very different. Uh, no, I'm I'm new to the drone world, but going into to um, Chrome, I could just adjust all my motor settings through the Chrome. Uh, yeah, extension. we're looking we're looking for a web enabled interface. Correct. Uh, eventually, yeah. eventually. There will still be the option to do it locally, but it's like if we can do it over the web, honestly, it's faster. So it's it's a better interface than Bluetooth anyway. Um, the other aspect of it is there is a uh, web browser data log analyzer that we have adopted from a kind of abandoned open source project. So we'll be having a upload button on your local logs, much like Meter has right now, that you can then share a web link and, and show your log. So we'll be quickly catching up to Meter-like functionality. Um, will, there be a way to, um, will there be a way to match up video and log data in a, in a simple, easy, side-by-side -side kind of web? YouTube on the left shows log, scrolling on the right so i mean there are ways to do that yeah um we could take a look at just see how roman did it honestly with meter because he's he's leveraging i think uh another third party program to do it anyway garmin yeah he's using garmin if i recall correctly mm -hmm. yeah that's correct i i i've used that exact setup and it actually gives you a pretty nice little overlay i don't know that i feel like it's something I'm interested in. It's just probably 
future 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 roadmap at, the, at this point um because that's that's definitely like a quality of life fluff feature <laughs> it's really like a different export format um right mm -hmm. yeah it's it's matching whatever export format for whatever you know third party overlay uh we want to pair it up with I was talking about video. a video overlay. What I meant was uh, it just plays a YouTube video, regular YouTube recording on the left, and it somehow syncs up the data on the right. It's kind of tough because the log gets paused when the board isn't moving. So there's some time things you might have to deal with. But if, if it's not a video overlay, I don't know if it'd be more simple. You don't have to go more into it, though. I see it's a far out feature, though. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of probably outside of the current scope right now, I would say. Yeah. Um, we can we can definitely get exports that are like compatible with different types of video editing overlay softwares, but I don't know beyond that. It'd just be awesome to export like a quick video to my social media of like ripping the board, but they can't feel the acceleration, but they could at least see what the power is. It's right. Really cool. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and that's that's one. If you do want a quick thing like that, you um, just live screen split screen apps with a gps app and then your camera recorder that's really the only way that's that's a smart one that's that's short term what you can do yeah outside of like a, a gopro and and then x like i've done the running meter exporting the log data pulling in gopro video and then actually it pulled some magical bullshit and synced them up i don't know exactly how it did it now that I think of it, um, it also did not work a few times, but a few times it did work and it was awesome. So, yeah, I was going to suggest that anybody, who, magical bullshit is the perfect word. Anybody who really wants this feature, because it's a great promoter feature, like people who want to promote stuff, uh, anyone who really wants it, if they could go figure out the magical bullshit and then simplify that down to if I got the data out from the phone in this way, this shit will explode. It will, I'll be able to use all these other tools to make the video. Like, you simplify the problem down to the uh, developers that way, and they'll be able to give you what you need. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, uh, is anybody sitting on a question that they didn't have a chance to uh, throw in? No? OK. Keep going, Andrew. Uh, I would say the only other thing that is on our roadmap and is like a firm one, as in balls are already officially rolling on it. Uh, our Once we have our free skate hardware and the mobile app and sort of data services stood up, uh, we're also working on an open reference design mountain board. Uh, we will be partnering with 121C boards. We are already working with them. They are wonderful people. Uh, they're awesome. They're actually like, I, I won't say much, but let's say they're actually space industry affiliated. NASA JPL affiliated. Yep. Um, and they're awesome. So we just did a successful custom project with them and pretty cool. We'll be getting actually a uh, article coming in upcoming uh, fairly popular online magazine type thing. Uh, I'm trying to trying to stay away from detail <laughs> on this until it's out. But uh, we did a collaborative project with 121C. And long story short is they're going to be doing a carbon fiber mountain board slash carver deck for us. Um, think about the size of a Cali XL, uh, somewhere around there size wise. Um, the ultimate goal here is to have a complete open hardware reference design of a carver and electric mountain board. So full 3D model of the trucks, the gear drive, the deck, uh, mounting hard points on our trucks for motor mounts, headlights, uh, other various accessories. Um, I The top mount, I would like to actually build a, a sleeker, more integrated approach uh, so that it's not just a huge box sitting up, but is a little bit uh, flatter and more uh, formed to the deck itself. Um, but the first the first goal is actually full e-mountain board with the second goal being carver. These will not be production boards. The end goal here is to provide a kit. 
So kit plus a wealth of documentation and videos and things like that to show how the kits go together, coupled with a open source electronic system such as Freescore, uh, Freeskate, and we have an open reference platform. And let the community be the warranty and you won't have to deal with all that shit. Well, I think with kits, you do sort of, in a way, place at least some of the warranty obligation on the user. That's just sort of the nature of kits. Obviously, um, <clears throat> this is, I, I feel like I need to sort of put a disclaimer on this. One of the goals is we're actually trying to develop all of the parts locally. And that's not a political move or anything like that. This is a economics and uh, shipping stuff across the ocean constantly is a major risk. So I part of this project is also building out uh, the means of making sure we have local sourcing. And to extend that, that also means that I would expect eventually for us to have a distributor in Australia or the UK that then sources their own parts and builds their own open reference platforms based upon this spec. And so we're not constantly shipping the same parts around globally. So that is sort of the end goal. Um, I don't like, I don't have any aspirations to be some massive global distributor. Uh, I, I think it's actually a pain in the ass to do that. I've done it. <laughs> like I, I've, I've yep. done the global distribution e-tailer thing for nine years and it's a pain in the day. Uh, when we started getting local distributors to handle various regions, things became so much easier. And so the more that people can manufacture locally and not have to burn up fossil fuels to ship across the pond back and forth, the better. Um, so those are my motivations behind local manufacturing. It's not a America first go USA manufacturing type deal. It's just, uh, it, it actually is starting to make sense in 2021. Uh, you can kind of see behind me the pick and place machine that has been my pet project in building out and setting up and getting running uh, during quarantine. Uh, that's one of those goals towards that. The other thing is, for example, we have our GPS X braces. Um, I found a local U.S. manufacturer that is actually competitive, and I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand what happened. But <laughs> here we are. So uh, we we have even local machining shops that we are working with to get the that up and running. Um, next steps beyond that are going to be trucks, gear drive. Um, we'll likely not be doing our own wheels. We'll probably, uh, out of the gate, just rely upon MBS wheels, uh, as well as their bindings, just because they've got the best bindings. <laughs> Ten bucks and they're good. So, yep, exactly. So, those are our major roadmaps uh, plans for DRI and Freeskate. I think that's kind of already feels like a. A three-year venture. <laughs> yeah, 18 uh, months. <laughs> so what's up with uh, freeskate.org? What is that going to be? Or Freeskate.org. Good question. Freeskate.org is going to be the Freeskate Codex. That is going to be our central library and location of all of our documentation. So that will be everything from our Robogachis to our remotes to general LEV, general e-bike, things like that. Kind of the idea is that'll be a major landing page. And then from there, they can dive in and, you know, get to almost just think of it like a community curated wiki. We put the best stuff we have forward and we can talk about it and trim it and, and whatnot. I'm using so GitHub not just pages. Noobs, just noobs as far as the eye can see. <laughs> no, it'll be honestly, it's going to be curated. I'm using GitHub pages, so people will be able to put in pull requests to make contributions uh, towards it, but it, it'll be a pull request and it'll have to be approved if it's going to actually be entered into the codex. So, but that is sort of the goal for it is the codex is going to end up being a uh, 
all-in-one information index on e-bikes, LEVs, uh, e-boards, things like that. So pulling in with e-bike, I, I, I know we probably had a side chat uh, with ADC. That's, um, is there anything I can do myself by hunkering down and, and drinking lots of coffee to push uh, ADC myself? Or is that kind of a dangerous... Uh, do you just want analog input? Uh, yeah, or, I mean... Hey, we're, we already have ADC. Oh, I thought that wasn't in, inside of a wizard setup inside the Robodachi. Uh, right now, it's. I'm sorry, On you're talking mobile app, not... Forgive on, me, yeah. Uh, it's, it's slated. It'll get there. Oh, fine. Uh, it's required for e-bikes, so we'll get there eventually. Uh, we just... For now, it is UART remote and PPM because the, those are the primaries. Yes, we want to make sure that ABC, works exactly. first. Of course. And Renee somehow managed to power through the entire app configuration like a weekend. <laughs> with COVID. I know. With, you, Renee. with COVID, no joke. And Wait, she you had COVID? Really? She's rebounded. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. There you go. Fucking trooper. Yeah. It's, yep. it's the weed. It's all that weed you're smoking. It is. Me and her, me and her yeah. had it. True story. It moderates the immune system response. <clears throat> she didn't yeah. it all the all the the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, just for clarity, all that about ADC was collecting telemetry on the ADC? With no, the no, no. ADC input and setup in... Uh, ADC is a type of... Oh, set up, set up, set up. Okay, yeah. yeah. No, I know what ADC is. I'm just... At first, I thought we were talking about adding an ADC input, which you said you had, on the controller, which we weren't talking about. Then it was Robogachi. And then Robogachi was like, collecting the data and recording the ADC values, or you're saying setting up ADC? All, all in, mobile right? app. All mobile yeah, app. Yeah. Yeah, forgive me. Uh, just ADC during collection data. Just because I have like four different scooters, and I'm not talking about Ryan affiliation, just boosted revs and other other little fun, fun devices. And I want to build a little trike, um, just to see like what my throttle values are. Oh, totally. I, no, we like the intention here is to build it out to work with balance. You are PPM ADC. We just had to like, like I said, she wasn't even supposed to be working. <laughs> I told her no working, and she's like, "I'm gonna do the app input." I'm like, <laughs> so that's you feel no, like we'll there. That's what you I mean, it's isolating. So I'm like, just gonna sit in this room, smoke weed, and do app config. Totally worked. Good plan. One yeah. thing I wanted to throw out while we were uh, uh, talking about the the pre skate stuff and uh, e bikes is um, for the light so show module. One lighting thing that I would want to work on is um, the, the slip rings for bikes. So you can put the lights on the wheel. It'd be cool if you had like, you could do a digital input with like a multiple slip ring thing or something there. How well do those slip? I guess they are. They have some that are really high RPM now that I think of it. Can so, someone send me a link? What are you guys talking about? Like, I wonder how long those can hold up is my, my biggest concern. I think they're a kind of thing where, like, you know, they work, and then when they break, you got to go in and fix them. It's like, I, yeah. I, I don't think they have any sort of, like, impact or shock rating, so them being on an axle. Would... Well, Andrew, I'm literally riding slip rings around on the lead attack in the rain. Yeah. So <laughs> That hurts me. It's, tech it's me. I have no gaskets, too. They just added gaskets recently to the newest version. Right now, there's no gaskets. It's just all the time. Do they break all the time or do they actually run? Uh, they work. We should go. We'll, well, I'll talk to you about it a lot more and, and, and stuff like that. But because I'm I mean, developing my own slip ring, right, I'm going right. all the way through. Uh, every challenge I mean, you can you can get you can get heavy duty slip rings they just cost an arm and a leg like they're yeah. so fucking expensive we had some uh, weird, look at them. ridiculous ones on the uh on the megabots project there but they were twelve hundred dollars that where the budget went oh god no. <laughs> <laughs> that's all the the budget went to that how and how base is where it went mm -hmm. okay yeah but yeah, just it, when you're thinking about the light show module, keep in mind that we can put lights with slip rings into the wheels and you can have like, you could have the thing where you like animate 
animate stuff in the wheels, like whatever you wanted bike, from the bikes. Yeah. I'm I'm definitely interested in that. I'm scared of it on skateboards. <laughs> yeah, I think well, what you could ship skip to also is uh oh, this sounds even worse, but like a Wi-Fi connected battery powered light wheel. This sounds terrible. I'm gonna stop talking about this. No more micro USB things to charge. Uh. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, I'll do it if it's USB C, but micro? No. So, guys, uh, real quick, I have a kind of a housekeeping question. Uh, is Saturday or Sunday a better day for everyone? For these? <clears throat> yeah, for these for these shop talks. Sunday is probably better for me, but I'm good with either. Saturday, typically. Saturday is as good as any. So either or. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, it's it's either or for 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 me. Um, Renee and I are full time on this now, so this <laughs> you tell us yeah. when. Um, just for is this your full time like no day job type of thing that's going on with the roadmap being this? Other than the token right there, yeah. Renee and I since uh, <laughs> since April, March, yeah, April. Yeah, full cool time for us. Awesome, um, Mooch. Did you did you get? Uh, I don't know where you put all your nickel testing of recent. Did you did you test out any of that? <laughs> um, working my way towards that now. Recovering from a nasty flare up. Damn. Some health issues that okay. limited me, but everything is uh, lined up. Had a couple things to bang out uh, ahead of that um, for the vaping community, but starting to move forward on it, and then I'm just gonna take like 30 days and crush through. Do you the, uh, do you need anything of, of that? Uh, right now, I think we're good. Uh, okay. But of course, as soon as I start, I'll go. Oh, yeah, this, 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 and then I'll I'll, I'll reach out and try to come up with some way. That I think presenting the data is going to be one of the biggest things. You know, it's great to have numbers. I think the way, no, no, not to throw everyone aside, but uh, what we're talking about though is, is like load testing, nickel testing. The way Pornhub does their end of the year, like graphing, take a page from them. They, <laughs> He's they, right. They, they He's totally right. That, that even my Mormon family would be like, this is good. And if we can bring that type of visibility to that, the smarter we get, the more we demand from our vendors, all, you know, China vendors as well. Like the smarter we enable our people, the better products we get and the more that will like, I don't know. That's my, that's my vision of it. And that's yeah. why I'm willing to like donate to testing. Yeah. You know, I mean, th there's a lot of things we can start to understand the difference between, you know, nickel, nickel plated steel that, you know, sometimes nickel plated steel is going to be better for, for spot welding than nickel might be. And, and, but are we, are we getting power loss? Won't mean anything to us or important enough. For us to be worried about or not, I, there's a lot of routes we can go. I certainly don't want to take away from what uh, um, we're trying to work with uh, for tonight's meeting, but I think we're going to open up all kinds of doors uh, once we start diving into some of the testing. Kind of the way the vaping community woke up to uh, going like, "Oh, what do you mean this 18650 isn't rated 100 amps?" Um, and and just some of that knowledge and the, the direct stuff we can apply in terms of uh, cell interconnects, uh, battery pack. The uh, heating, the safety, stuff like that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to throw out there, uh, at a certain point, you should probably get all of your data and archive it on GitHub. You can put it up under uh, whatever type of license that you want, like a non-commercial license so nobody else can actually use it commercially, for example. Uh, right. But it's a good way of putting it on public record and establish you own it. ownership of it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I have I've been sitting on a couple of, of, of domains for a while. It's it's been a time issue. It's been triggering out what where do I want all this to lead commercially and personally. Um I I think it's a good idea. Uh it, it's picking some way other than you know hosting it on where it you know just slowly started growing. And and where it is now um, on the electronic cigarette form, because uh, it's gone so far beyond that too. Well, I view you as the Monroe of Tesla. If you, anyone subscribes to those, cool. It's it's um, it, and a lot of it is 
you know, just would I want all of it to head? <laughs> There's some big decisions coming up. Uh, COVID sure. has um, slam dunk the day job. So that this that opens up opportunities. Uh, but it also makes it hard to take the, you know, hundreds of hours to say, okay, let's take all this and go here. Uh, or, hey, let's start over. And uh, what, what would I want a fresh start GitHub or, or my own site to be? Uh, but I think, I think overall, it, it, yeah, you know, make a place that's mine and uh, harden it in terms of um, what people can do and not do with it. And then figure out, uh, okay, what are the next five years? As opposed to uh, the bunts I've taken, uh, at least in terms of um, consumer level battery testing, you know, where do I want to take this? Cool. And also, to certain point, I just don't want to be, that's all I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life, testing batteries, you know, thousands of hours, tens of thousands of dollars, and no revenue stream. You know, what are, what are some other things and places and ways that I can be doing? Um, expanding, still you know, offering things to community, which I love. The safety aspect is, is really important to me personally. Um, but uh, what what does it turn into? Have you have you touched into the Powerwall community at all? I have. I find that's a uniquely price sensitive community, mm -hmm. uh, at, at which uh, safety will be given up at a moment's notice to save a penny or two per cell. <laughs> Uh, Mooch, have you thought about going on to uh, Jehu's podcast? You just started up. Yeah. Um. No invite, and you know I'm, I'm certainly not gonna. He know. he had Jason Potter on, so he should definitely have you on. I mean. you, he had. Oh, you? Come on. <laughs> Jay, Jay and I have talked about a couple of things, but um, uh, Jehu is very much for uh, enabling the community to come up with their own solutions, develop the products, market them, etc. And he'll be a, a guidance as to where those things might happen or not happen. And that doesn't doesn't fit my model as much. Um, I test, you know, prime cells. Um, I I uh, I have safety limits. I have things that the DIY power wall community goes that cost money. <laughs> you know, and it, it's just not an option for them to to spend, you know, more than a dollar a cell or something like that. Uh, just because it's a lot fewer concerns, and I'm not trying to fault them at all, but fewer concerns when you've got all your cells sitting over here in the garage versus somebody who's, you know, going 40 kilometers an hour on the board and their thoughts about safety <laughs> or a paper who's got a cell up against their face. They're going to have different priorities and they're going to be willing to pay for it typically. But firewall community goes, you know, those fires are pretty rare and it's going to happen in my garage anyway. I, I would, I would expect them to be way more safety centric. That's disheartening, honestly. That's it's. I feel like that's what's going to bring regulation down like a hammer on stuff like that. Well, that vaping. That's what's happening to vaping now, and and the the um, you know thousands of accidents a year uh, that that you don't see that involved uh, emergency visits for electronic circuit community, most of them are because they put bare cells in their pocket, but it, it's still And I think for the power wall community, if they're not attracting enough attention to themselves, it's low enough power. Um, I, I think just the fact that they, they're they matching internal resistance and capacity and doing that kind of preliminary testing gets rid of the worst of the cell uh, to it. But um, all it would take, yeah, would be a couple of you know, big fires in California or something to start a, uh, a movement there because their, you know, their attention to things like that. And then, mm -hmm. the, you know, and, and also the thing is, there's not as uh, not as big an opportunity to tax the DIY right. power off, which keeps them off the radar of the politicians where vaping, uh, you know, it takes away a lot of tobacco dollars the Master Control Act for tobacco dollars coming in. So they're like, right. whoa, we got to regulate this. Right, uh, right. That's, wow, that's, that's a really interesting, that. that's a really interesting but perspective. I think, uh, yeah, that. Yeah, that makes Jacob, total sense. Um, you know, Jacob and I talked a couple times, but certainly if he called, I go, yeah, you know, let, let's talk sales. Let's talk the trade-off of uh, your 75 cent salvage sale versus your $3 prime sale. And then I desperately want to get into other things and do battery testing. But, 
because yeah, that's my background. And you know, when when you've done uh, one of my like 325 different cells, there's just not a lot left to test in terms of a cell. Well, actually, no. Molly cells got some. You're going to be happy with Molly cell this year. Uh, but yeah. you know, toss, toss, not, toss, toss. <laughs> oh man, oh man. Not a word. But you know, it's the kind of thing. You know, if I get samples. The, the results get released. Well, my patrons will know way before anybody else, but then, you know, you know the, the stuff gets released. And, uh, but at a certain point you go, I, 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 I don't want to test full time, the latest China piece of junk, you know, unless you're willing to spend a fortune for a promotion or something like that. And, and even then it's just what, what they're going to, they're going to spend a bunch of money to have me say, oh, this rating is bullshit. <laughs> That's not a great revenue stream for me. Uh, so, so there's other things for me to, to move into and back more into my room and stuff like that, but still staying with the battery testing, uh, helping the community understand the safety. And even more important now that I think a lot of people are becoming a little more aware of the safety aspect of things is performance. Everyone is so capacity driven, not realizing that uh, your 5,000 milliamp hour cell is giving you less less capacity than your three thousand milliamp hour cell is because you're mm -hmm. running them so hard. Mm -hmm. You have delivered watt hours, mm -hmm. uh, kind of concepts, and I think there's still opportunities there for a lot of different communities to say, okay, yeah, you know, stop shopping by capacity. Hopefully, all this uh, free skate data sharing, like collaborative stuff like that, will help people understand what what the actual like performance requirements for parts are and help right. them find the correct things to suit their needs. Yeah, even early on with, you know, using meter and one of the first things I, you know, wanted to get a sense of like, what is my average watt hour per mile consumption on these various boards and things like that. that. So the, the data that I was looking for, I would mm -hmm. say, I wanted to compare, you know, a, a four wheel drive setup versus the one wheel. And yes, you can look at the numbers, you can start calculating. And I'm like, can mm -hmm. I just have a bunch of logs throw some stuff up for me just to get that back of the mind okay it's four times better here you know it's crap over here and just to get an idea and it helps point to you know how people are using their packs and, and uh because uh, for me you know i'm still thinking about the first board i want to do uh you know what is it three months in of just soaking in what the community's got for me as as a uh, eastgate uh new and uh to say, okay, you know, do I want a 24S 2P kind of screamer thing, or do I want to come in a 10S 10P? Uh, and and a lot of that, where I'm coming and trying to balance that off, I'm realizing it's also, also decisions other noobs would be making in terms of the battery packs and choosing cells, and or who do I buy a pack from, who supports this kind of use is that kind of use. So I don't know where mm -hmm. that goes, but I'm fascinated by the data and, and what all of you are putting together and, and the access to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's been really interesting to watch. I jumped into uh, Eastgate probably around three years ago now at this point is when I really started getting like involved. And I actually ran into the guys, uh, the two guys that had founded Hoyt street when they were just they just gotten their board out they had their bamboo puck and everything and i ran into them really early on and uh funny enough they were like hey so we got this kind of angry email from this guy frank could you take a look i'm not kidding though that was literally my intro <laughs> that that's the interesting thing for me to see you know as you come into a community and you start to see uh, the more um, opinionated members of the community, yeah. more colorful discussions. And it's been fascinating to see what Frank says and, and how Trump is coming at things versus what the rest of the community is going, whoa, 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 what? Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's outsider. It's, it's been uh, pretty, pretty interesting. It Coming, coming from the, coming from kind of you know open source hardware and the open source development community, like Renee and I have a decent amount of uh, background there. Uh, it's been interesting to see the impact of a corporate entity with a very closely knit commercial interest to a GPL IP. Uh, 
So it's there. There've been some. Would you say that's uh, unusual? So no, not necessarily. Um, like it's not the same story. But look into the Arduino controversy if if you uh, want okay. to read at some point. Um, not the same thing, but this sort of stuff pops up here and there, and a lot of the copy left laws are a little ambiguous in understanding or general clarity. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting and there have definitely been some pretty some some I'll call them interesting moves by Trampa in this regard. <laughs> but uh, ultimately, you know, it is a general public license. It's out there. You, you know, the technology is there to use so long as you are sensitive to trademarks and certain uh, <laughs> images and or words being used. Uh, it, you know, you can still sort of operate. One of our challenges was sort of figuring out how close we really wanted to get with all of that. And as close as Quinn. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I just took apart my VX1 because the poten potentiometer literally snapped. Those joysticks suck. They are not supposed to be on a mission critical thing. I hate those. Yeah. They're like for children. Things are toys. so cheap. I, I see them everywhere. Um, if, only, if only someone was replacing them with something good. <laughs> yeah. I think my VX2 not... broke. Um. <laughs> But yeah, no, ultimately, you know, we have a really like incredible set of technology with the best project sitting there that has enabled us to get to where we are. Um, really, I, I think our approach is just sort of to fill in the gaps and try and build a system around that to sort of wrap in while we develop out our own system. But we're I I feel like I feel like we can at least sleep at night knowing that these things are going to go towards a public uh, repository for the uh, <laughs> public record. Ultimately. So it's it's been fun to watch the uh, you know the industry sort of bob and weave through this. But I think one of the one of the unique things about this that we're seeing is not only is there a bit of wild wild west to it. It's one of the first times that a technology is available to your everyman that enables a significant amount of personal mobility. And like it this this has happened in smaller sex, you know, almost with like motorcycles and, and things like that. But this is a new technology that's clean, and all of a sudden you have, you know, your average person can put together an e-bike for a couple hundred dollars and extend their mobility and their range overall significantly. And so I think that creates a bit of a gold rush mentality around this. But no. it's, it's been a trip to watch. You're, you're right. There's some interesting players that have showed up to this. It also uh, breeds creation, you know. It's a, it's a, it just breeds making things and manufacturing, which – saw a video with, uh, I don't know who it was. It was on Lee's YouTube channel, but he's, he would, he's been doing mountain boarding for his whole life, basically. And he said, mm -hmm. man, the manufacturers are coming out of the woodworks now. People, they just really spark something in people. And that's what I love about it. And yeah. the community. It's the lockdown, I think, is, is, or general COVID situation has is, is inspired a lot of this, too. I know here in New York City, uh, I'm seeing at least the scooter community and city bike rentals. The um, city has uh, rented bikes here. People don't want to be in the trains. People don't want to be packed together with anybody. So even in winter, you know, the personal mobility kind of thing is, is skyrocketed. For me, uh, having limited mobility with some health issues I'm dealing with, that put me on a scooter, that which then led to wanting to go to a board because, like, mm -hmm. you know, it's a little bit easier. I thought it might be a little more fun at my age. I break when I fall. I don't bounce, but I'm thinking, you know, I'm still, I still want to graduate to a board. Uh, so I think there can be a trend that can start and, and still be here. You know, six months from now, eight months from now, people might go, oh, do I want to get back in the subway again? Like, no, I'm kind of liking what I did before and, you know, what I bought. Uh, 
particularly when you look at riding the subway costing $110 a month anyway to commute. If I don't need to spend that, whoa, what does that free me up to buy? And I get to use the board, the bike, the scooter, whatever, all the, the rest of the time anyway. Yeah, I feel like I'm, that trend only increases as like social infrastructure adapts. You know, uh, here here locally, we saw uh, electric scooters rolled out initially, and then obviously the government did their thing with them. But within months, which which is supremely fast, you know, considering how our government normally acts, um, regulations were put into place. These insurance, uh, these scooters were insured. And they were back on the streets, and people are now riding them legally. It, it, it's incredible how quickly things are adapting, uh, and even just in infrastructure in terms of being able to lock up your scooter, where you can charge your scooter. And that, with time and more interest, that's only going to continue increasing and continue uh, making it a lot more feasible for for people. So many things are economically viable now that possibilities for electric transport are are just like ridiculously we, we open for anybody to change we bought a uh, rad runner in mid-april and was one of the best purchases i think we've made in the last five years um my my partner she rides it probably 80 percent of her transit now like the the car barely even gets used so like it, it seriously has completely replaced the majority of her car usage right out of the gate. Is and that a utility cool. bike? That What's is, that? Is that a utility bike? Rab what? It's called a Rad Runner. They're a company up in Seattle. We paid eleven hundred dollars for it, and it has like a forty mile range on it. It's great. Like it's it's just a fantastic bike, and it's been flawless. Like we had to adjust the. Uh, had to tension the brakes a bit, <laughs> you know, like replace a flat uh, tire once, and that was that. Aren't so, those like modular with a bunch of you can put a bunch of storage on it and stuff? Too? Yeah, no, they're they're really good, like uh, commuter bikes. You can kit them out with full storage racks and everything, but they start just real cheap. I think what it is is they they ship over parts and it's local assembly is how they're doing it. What voltage is it? Uh, I think it's just a 10S. Okay. It's just no, got, it's got it. the real standard, like, sort of loaf-shaped <laughs> battery <laughs> that slides on. Like battery. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure it's just a, a 10S, if I recall. Honestly, I haven't even paid attention. It's I, I ride it here and there, and it's fun. It does, like, 25, maybe 28 if you're pushing it. Uh, but the pedal assist works flawlessly. The throttle works great. I was just blown away for an eleven hundred dollar light vehicle, more or less. That out of the, I think she's gotten. Uh, I think her max is like forty six miles on it at one point, the single wow. large. So that's for, again, personal mobility. Say again. She didn't do any other forty six mile bike rides before that. No. I did a 36 Ooh. month bike ride on acid once. That was a trip. Yeah, oh, that's always too. <laughs> did you even get anywhere? <laughs> uh, so I feel like I have bookmarks way back in this conversation. But uh, I wanted to say the whole, how do I say this? Uh, I commend you on the difficulty of trying to decide where to go in relation to the best project. Because the best project is like a core thing to us and it is open source, uh, but it has the two problems. It has the Frank and it has the, uh, the vetter doesn't take as much input because he's, he's an introvert. Um, well, to be fair, uh, I mean, I, I talk to vetter constantly. So the, that, to be fair, I actually have an open dialogue with Better all the time. Um, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's not an issue. I wanted, to, I wanted to say that uh, I, I appreciate the difficulty there and like the whole idea of yeah. like you're going to bring your own EC to market and at some point you're going to make the call like does this run completely different firmware for real reasons or does Better participate and also like this thing and like come over and like we kind of stand on the backs of where we were before. And I appreciate that that decision is hard. That's all I'm, I'm saying. Thank you. 
Uh, so the second bookmark was uh, the did, the Trampa stuff. Did you see that Brian uh, Bet B two six four is uh, maintaining his now uh, de-skinned fork of Vestool and the releases? I did. Uh, okay, I thought I thought that was interesting because some of the work is essentially in keeping up with the Vestool code base and stripping out Vestool so that you can comply with the, the trademarks. And it looks like someone has finally stepped up to do that. And so. I'm hoping maybe that gets traction and anyone else who's who's considering adding features or whatever is not blocked by the trademark stuff as a result. Yeah, that's called ver uh, very ESC, correct? Yeah, V A R I like very ESC. I mean, uh, let me let me let me back up and share this with you guys. Um, in March of last year, I, I've shared this before. I went down to meet up with uh, Benjamin Vetter and Jeffrey Friesen and basically discuss best project roadmap. What's Frank's deal? Um, <laughs> that was it, like truthfully. And we we had a good productive conversation. We called Frank. I, I asked him some questions about things and tried to tried to come to an understanding. Overall, like communication was solid. Um, I, I have to give Frank credit as much as we may disagree on how uh, certain things should be handled. Uh, he does his best to always maintain a very professional decorum and, and you know respectful communication in that. So I do have to give him credit where credit's due. Uh, Vetter and I have like an open dialogue on this. The way where we stand is that our reservations are specifically around getting entrenched in an open source project that has a entrenched private corporate interest already in place. And the reasons being is that we are essentially building out technology for a private corporation, even if it is under GPL license. Um, and thus are imposed by the restrictions of that corporation as well. As a company ourselves, that doesn't really make a lot of sense if we're looking at this from an outside perspective. Um, it would make more sense for us to dedicate our time towards building out our own novel intellectual property, which is what we've done with Freeskate so far. So as I, I said it before, Renee threw all of Vesk tool out the window and started with Creescape ground up from scratch. Obviously, we've looked at Vesk tool. It's open source. It's out there, but it is a it is our own intellectual property. We can license it however we choose, which is one of the reasons that we can have it on iPhone, and it's not an issue uh, because of a GPL conflict. Um, that same sort of philosophy is going to continue to apply to our hardware moving forward. And so I think it just at a certain point makes sense. There are plenty of ESC options out, VESC based ESC options on the market right now. There are a number of them and they're solid and it's way better than it was a year ago. That is healthy for the market. I want to see lots of ESCs on the market um, and more technology companies coming to show up there needs to be a lot more growth before this becomes sustainable and large. Like we are at a very early up on the trajectory. And so that's why I don't really understand the scarcity mentality that pops up sometimes because this is still early on where we're, it's a, it's a long ride ahead. This technology is barely past RC hobby cars right now. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> so, um, uh, I think we, the way we, that the way that people actually get their items and get these boards like this, that, that has to evolve a lot right now. Yeah, yeah. Right now you buy a complete board and you end up having to tear it apart and fix all these things with it. And it just and there needs are to no proprietaries to, on any sort of pre-built or production board on top of it. Yeah, it's 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 sort of just uh, it's all over the place because it's a new market and it's early on. Like it, it just comes with the territory really. But um, to, to wrap up what I'm saying is like, I, I have a huge respect for Benjamin Vetter and the work that he's put into it. Vest project is an enormous lift. It doesn't fit our exact goals in our main roadmap. And so 
we can sort of do a lot of work to build a system out around that still stays compatible with all of the ESCs out there. But we're approaching it more from an ESC agnostic standpoint. And so that means not only are we looking to eventually develop our own ESC, but like Kelly controllers, for example, would be another thing we'd look at potentially adding support for, or you know, looking at interfacing different ESCs and staying truly ESC agnostic, as that's just a motor, it's just a motor controller, it's just one component in the system, um, as, as opposed to being the primary. So that's sort of how we're approaching it. And eventually we will get to the point where we're probably going to want our own ESC hardware sooner rather than later and have to start moving on that. But I've made these exact reasons uh, you know, I've communicated them with Benjamin Vetter and he completely understands. So there's there's no, you know, ill will or animosity towards there's a huge respect for the work that he's yeah, done. I wasn't thinking. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I just I just want to clarify. We we chose to do it because we are trying to do things differently because we have this vision for a much larger platform. And while ESC technology is super important. To us, it is one component of a much larger system. So, would you consider um, Would you consider a free skate uh, DC current shunt for monitoring any electrical thing? You are Canbus, just a, a shunt that clamps over the battery terminal line. Yeah, just to add to any electric part of the board. You, you mean just like a coulomb counter? Yep. Uh, no, I meant. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like if. If that was well, if you like could get the current soil. data out of the ESC, just measure the current. I feel like that's Voltage something. If you were to add that, I feel like that would be best added to a BMS. Honestly. Oh yeah, no, totally. That makes if you have it in the battery module, that makes sense. I was thinking if you had something you wanted to add, free skate, you know, tracking to something, and you just wanted to get current measurement without uh, actually even talking about I mean, any independent device, any standalone device is a pretty big lift. So like, oh. it, it's okay, yeah. you always want to add something into what you're existing about. system than to create its own isolated standalone device and then have to integrate that in. Gotcha. So something like that, I could see uh, us, you know, maybe if we can find uh, a, a cheap small coil that's well suited for something like this, Maybe I mean the two dollars. Yeah, yeah. we've <laughs> Renee and I don't. Uh, Renee and I didn't want to look at coils ever again. I know. <laughs> There's a lot of scooters and e-bikes out there that people just want to clamp one device on. But then the question yeah. was, where do you power the logic for that? Where do you where do you grab that bus? So it's it's a slippery slope. Yeah, I figured so. that you'd thought about it, so I just wanted to ask. When you I mean, mentioned your own, it's the sort of thing that you can the. The front end balancers, as well as the 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 back end switching circuitry with some of the TI stuff, has Coulomb counting built into it. That's pretty damn accurate. So it's like, it at a certain point you don't really need to externally measure it. A lot of times you do that. A lot of times you tap onto that because you're tapping on to an existing system or infrastructure. Like that's why those coils exist. That's why they're clamp on. Now. That's not to say you can't get better data by, you know, putting a coil on a line. I just don't know if it's necessarily worth it. We can, I'm open to it, but I don't know how much better the data is going to be over just the, the basic Coulomb counting measures we have now. Cool. Other than the universal plug and play uh, aspect, of it, that's it. Yeah. When you mentioned uh, your own ESC hardware, I always assumed you also meant your own ESC firmware. Is that, does it go yes. hand in hand? Yeah, okay. yeah they would. Uh, and then no. related to the way you earlier, or actually you mentioned it twice, the central core idea with the ESC being uh, simply the motor controller. Mm -hmm. does it, so that sounded like you're saying the goal is to have your control signal coming from that central controller. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so. Is that is the Robogachi supposed to evolve into that? Is that going to have PPM and UART inputs, or I guess it's going to have only UART for the? So a good way to look at a good way to look at the Robogachi, and I'll ex like I, I have no problem just being super transparent about this. Robogachi was in a way a 
productization of a technology platform we were developing, right? What it was was asynchronous QSPI flash storage on an NRF chipset with an app and then a file transfer. That in itself is like a laundry list of tech that needs to be built out and developed to do that. From there, we can take that and we can integrate that to, uh, we could literally stick a flash chip onto any ESC that has a storm core and essentially give them asynchronous flash technology because we built out all the plumbing from that. The Robogachi is like a fully featured productization of that. But the technology platform itself is somewhat flexible. We can move that around to different hardware. So with the core, likely what will eventually happen out of the gate, the core is probably going to be pretty simple. It's going to be a Wi-Fi interface. Uh, it's going to be a... Uh, the Wi-Fi interface is pr predominantly for security pairing of the dedicated radio uh, radios for the remote, uh, which is a separate radio on the core as well. Um, and it's primarily going to just function as a controller, giving taking in throttle, giving out CAN bus, ESCs, right? So storage is a separate component in the long run from from core. So eventually it will probably move to the core. Right now, the core design has a secondary UART that is dedicated to plug in a data logger to it. We're not doing data logging on the core out of the gate, but eventually we will. It doesn't have quite as much storage um, as the Robogachi, for example, has about half the amount of storage. So there, there are some things that we need to get to a certain, past a certain check point before we try and then port that technology over to the core. Eventually, the core could very well have the same technology. And then the Robogachi is just a local data logger. It, it's something if you just want to throw it with Bluetooth transfer, it's our basic local. And then the core could then function in both because the core has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi on it. So it could do local mode or it could do data services online upload mode. Does that make sense? No. Uh, <laughs> well, what should I clarify? Uh, I guess the boundaries of the things is sort of, it sounds like it's all the thing. What is the core? The core's first, core gen one is to- uh, Core gen one, uh, hard, let, me, let me just explain real quick. The core gen one, is a radio dedicated radio receiver, an ESP32 that has integrated flash, and then CAN bus, uh, optional PPM UART comms, but predominantly just going to run as a CAN bus controller, as a primary CAN bus controller. Okay, and so, then the radio one that would do, you said BLE and Wi-Fi earlier, but you're saying, would it be BLE, Wi-Fi, and then NRF for the remote? You expect the remote to connect NRF there? Is not, NRF is not involved at all. So do you expect the remote to connect there as a controller, or what is... The remote connects through a dedicated radio that is on the core. So there's... there's the core kind of brings the data uh, from the BMS and the ESC both onto the remote. Yes, correct. The core acts as like a central hub over CAN bus, and yeah. then it has its own radio for... Wi-Fi Bluetooth, which is like configuration interface. And then it has a whole separate radio and MCU that is dedicated just for the remote radio. That's a totally different thing. Now, when the remote radio is active, the Wi-Fi Bluetooth is inactive. So it's only ever active for configuration. You don't like cramming all sorts of radios into a small space? I don't see what's wrong with that. My, I think my record, my is, record three. is three. I'm writing three in one in one small computer like this big. <laughs> I'm running four right now, right? I mean, you know what? Cell phone sort of paved the way for for us on the FCC <laughs> yellow tape. <laughs> Multi radio devices. Okay, the last question on the core is: How far away is the first core? Hardware manufacturing is already underway. The radio like, for remotes and core. Uh, so remotes and core will come out together because their core is the, for the remote. 
you you don't have you don't have a radio on the board without a core because the core has both has your Wi-Fi and, and has your dedicated. So for the remotes, where did you land on on radio technology? You were They're doing running, it. We're running a XB three eight zero two dot one five dot four radio. It's the same series we used in the original OSRR. Actually, we used a mix of the S2C and the XB3 in beta testing, and they're pretty much identical. The XB3 actually has a bit better performance. Okay, yeah, yeah, I remember now. Yeah, they're, uh, it's an FCC modularity licensed standalone radio. They are a bit expensive. They're about $15 a piece. Um, so we're, we're investing a decent amount into radios. Part of what you're paying for is the ability to sell these internationally without getting, you know, swiftly kicked. Uh, the Kevin, other, you said $15 each, so that must be a reasonable price. What's that? I said, Kevin didn't laugh at you when you said $15 each. So that must be a reasonable price. They've come down. <laughs> they used to be double that. <laughs> And I mean, honestly, some of them do. What's also nice is we have with XBs, I currently have a socket. Uh, have you seen any of the designs that I've that I've posted on it so far on the remote? Uh, no, are they in the Telegram? I only joined two days ago. Oh, no, they're on the Freescape forums. Oh. Um, well, then I just glanced over them. Sorry. Yeah, there, <laughs> there, there, there's a remote thread in there that has some of the designs. Um, the, the majors on the remote, we basically iterated forward from the original OSRR hardware. So it's the same radios. We had an uh, ESP8266 on the beta hardware, now running an ESP32. So we actually have one in the remote as well as one on the Freescape core. Um, and then one of the tricks that I'm pulling, let me show you, for the Bruce model, because we needed something nice and slim, we're actually uh, borrowing this Canon uh, 1500 milliamp digital camera battery. Uh, it has a built-in thermistor on it and everything. So this will make a easily sourceable, these things cost, you can get them generic for like five or $6 a piece or even cheaper on Alibaba if you wanna risk it. But um, I don't. They're, they're cheap enough as is, and they last a, a long time. So far, testing on them has been great, too. But it's USB-C, haptics, 90 decibel uh, buzzer. Uh, we've got a 1 point, uh, is it, I can never remember if it's 1.3 1 or 1.1. 1 .1. I think it's a 1.3 <laughs> uh, uh, inch color TFT display, and then a pair of those XP radios. So um, it is just a iteration from the original hardware, as I said. The Wi-Fi radios pretty much only exist to, right now, out of the gate, they're only going to exist to turn on and to do security pairing of the XB radios, the handshake, and then pair them and let it go. From, beyond that, it'll be inactive until we develop out more of the core technology. But the first order of business is getting the remote radio link fully you know established and testing our remotes so um question as far as eastgate has traditionally been one channel allocated for whatever like light break pulse horn um vibrating whatever like any any plans to enable a link between your hand and what you want to control on the board or by yep. et cetera so we have, uh, we have a power button, and then we have three externally mountable uh, push buttons that are going to be for user uh, input. The One of them is probably going to be dedicated towards a throttle lock. So uh, I've gotten addicted to the Hoyt puck and being able to just double tap. And I, I agree. I ran over a dog in the dog park uh, once because I didn't have throttle lock. So. As it was actually yeah, that's that's never never fun. Um, <laughs> so yeah, one of them will probably be dedicated towards throttle lockout, um, and then two could very well be like buzzer and or lights. You know, 
the the other two. Um, I kept them externally mountable because I didn't think sticking them on the PCB made a lot of sense. I was going to end up in an awkward spot. So the idea is they're actually going to be custom mounted into the enclosure. Uh, the other thing with these remotes is we are staying with MJF printed uh, enclosures for as long as I can tell. Uh, the manufacturing process has actually gotten affordable enough to move forward with it. These are premium remotes. They have a $75 industrial thumb wheel in them already. So it's like, why not? Yeah. What's your materials cost uh, shipped to you? Like seven bucks for printed landed or a lot less? Or it, I don't need to know if it's, it's top secret. I'm just curious. For MJF? No, I mean, it's it's still decent. Like a decently sized two, two pieces of a decently sized remote is still going to be anywhere from, depending on the size, 20 to $30. But versus trying to come out with three oh, remotes... Yeah three different remote designs and then having to field the tooling and mold costs for that. Nah. So for now <laughs> and for the foreseeable future, we will be, uh, we'll be running with MJF and honestly the material finish and the durability on it's incredible anyway. So yeah, yeah I, I've crashed and I can't even tell, like I look at the thing and I can't find any scratches. Yeah, Bill's even uh, survived his for the most part. Although, actually, this is a good time to bring that up. If you crash with your puck, turn it off immediately until your what? wheels are up and you can confirm. Why? What do you mean? So if the puck takes a direct hit to the, oh, the thumb wheel yeah. and breaks the actual pot leg off. Yes, three legs. It's full throttles. And that's the, that's yeah. The same with ADC when you're using regen. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's scary as fuck. So it what sucks is it's really easy. Like with OSRR, you can yank your throttle right out, and it detects the disconnect and goes to neutral. Because yep. I have it actually monitoring a very specific range, voltage range, exactly. And, and that's where and, that, and that's where I want like a free vest or that project. Um, like when I'm doing ADC on scooters. I either have to build in a fail safe that pushes out 1.8 volts, which is neutral, or I'm, I'm fucked. Yeah, uh, I don't. There's no fail safe built into the vest. No, no, it's fucked up because what? It's well, I mean, so unless if I'm if you're running reverse like I am, if you want to, otherwise it's gonna go full brake. Mm -hmm. Like so, that's a hundred amps brake. Uh, wow. If you go with the uh, the Grin Technologies like Phase Runner. They have a fail safe, so Whoa. zero to zero point seven, nothing, and then like three to five, nothing as well. Not on Besk. Zero volts to me is one hundred percent reverse, or actually forward throttle. Quinn, are you all right? Hey man, uh, I, I got just got taken out by this tree right here. We're doing free skates, so you don't use the phone on your board. Exactly. <laughs> I think I jinxed you. I'm still on my property. I'm not riding. Hey, just Andrew. Hiking. Since since you're so close with uh, Hoyt, um, you know how Joner was the original uh, EE on that? What's – um? Does... He, was, he wasn't. Oh, he wasn't? Oh, okay. I, I, they, I don't know they, who was. They worked, with a, they worked with a drone company that well, makes the radios. What is the mysterious – like, no, no one seems to know what the Morse codes are. It points out sometimes. It's never been documented, and I can't get it from Jeff. I've had a few non non-critical – but do you have any insight on like what, what do you mean the certain, beeping? Yeah, certain beeping when you have like I'll, I'll pull down a voltmeter immediately. It's still like four point one, so I know it's not a low voltage. That's yeah, uh, I, that's it's connectivity. Good. Yes, so connectivity means it dropped out like one time for more than yes. Oh, so just one time. Hey, you're in a weird place. That's what it. happens? No, here's you can you can replicate the behavior by turning on your board with a paired remote and walking right to the edge of the range. Ah, okay. And then walk back in and, and watch what happens. Beautiful, thank you. That is a variable. will make it beep a number of different times depending upon how long you're out of range. Because it basically, as soon as it drops, it starts going beep, 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 like this until it reconnects. If it's cutting in and out, that can get chopped up and sound like Morse code, but it's not. That's okay. just you dropping out. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yep, guys, I'm from the Lacroix Farms here, and Hoyt doesn't cut out. Hey, hey, hey! <laughs> I mean, in San Francisco, 
fucking I anything is possible. Like I've never in San Francisco with a Hoyt ever. I and I haven't either. I was commuting uh to I was commuting down to the piers uh from Portland <laughs> with my board hopping on Amtrak and going back and forth and even with OSRR it was perfectly fine downtown. So it, I, was doing a long beach ride. I was doing a long beach ride and, and Barrett, this guy comes up and he says, what does it mean when your Hoyt is doing this? And it's like, it blinks red and vibrates. Like, what is that? I'm like, I don't know. I've never had mine do that. That battery? Mine the did battery. that too. And That's the other one. I, I get battery. phantom vibrations sometimes though while I'm riding and always in the same place. And I find that really interesting. I told yeah, Jeff. I don't know like, I'm I'm it's like disconnect. Yeah, yeah, that's but, actually and, a good one to bring up. I, I I skipped over that one. The battery low is pretty annoying too because yes, it's please really don't make it waste energy constant. vibrating. <laughs> yeah, no, it's constant. Um, it was not battery low. It was it was definitely not battery low. I'm I'm working with the with the guys at Hoyt right now to communicate with their manufacturer to put in a fail safe to the throttle. Uh, so if that breaks, it defaults. And then the other one, the other one to be aware of is if you are riding and your throttle is engaged and then you double tap the power button, it will lock your throttle at the position it's at, which is not the type of cruise control you want to be screwing around. I've got one. I, know that. I've got one. I tested this. Uh, if you if you hold down the reverse button while you're on the throttle, it'll switch and go full throttle reverse on you. Oh. Okay. Jesus Christ. I told Jeff um, about that one. Okay, I hang on. So what, what <laughs> maybe we should publicly circ- document these things so that yeah, others so know. What I did to circumvent all this, I only have one button on my, my custom remote and all the other ones I have to push with a paper clip on purpose. I don't like accidentally hitting the mode button or yeah. use the well, reverse. And there's I not to be self serving here, but there's a reason that I dropped all the buttons into the face of the puck puck bruce was to prevent them from being accidentally pressed. Yep. So it's it's a lot harder to press them now with the with the I How does that, that change on my puck puck bruce? What's that? Like I, well, I, I literally noticed that change. I noticed how much more difficult it was to accidentally push the buttons. How, how does the mode how do the modes work actually on the the Hoy Puck? What it does is it cuts down the actual PPM, uh, PPM output range. Yeah, it, it just scales it on the, on the puck. Mm-hmm. Does it does it change it changes your uh, throttle curve too? Right though, uh, it depends know. on how much exponential you have. Absolutely, you are giving it way too much credit. <laughs> All it does is the remote output itself changes, so your throttle curve is best side. So just figure the first half of that curve. Uh-huh. If, if you're at 50% or 75% of it, if you're at 75. I think I measured 1.5, 1.7, 1.9 in the mode. There's something on a oscilloscope. Whatever it is, it's it's just limiting. That's correct. Yep, that, that's about right from memory as well. Um, I mean, overall, it's still the best remote we have, honestly, is like an off-the-shelf solution. There are some things they can improve for sure. Uh, the reverse thing is good to know. I'm already working with JJ uh, to put together basically change requests on the firmware. Unfortunately, we have to go through the manufacturer to get those done. So uh, I know how to fix it and what needs to be fixed. If there's anything else that you guys can think of that comes up, please shoot it our way. The great thing about Hoyt is that they are hands down one of the most receptive like uh, companies I've worked with here. So yep. they're great. They're super willing to hear input and they're eager to stay on top of changes. So they're they're good people to work with. They worked with. with me to solve a problem when I tried to blame them and it was like my misunderstanding <laughs> of the configuration thing. They're really great guys. Oh no, they're they're wonder like their customer service is top notch. So I mean they listened but, to me and built a nub. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, yeah. No, I mean, I don't know how much of a. I, I think I just pushed it loudly enough that uh, they're like, you know, we might as well. Um, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, I'm thinking about knocking mine down a little bit and then re-knurling, re-knurling with a um, a carbide something, just scraping it. I don't like how long it is. You should put diamonds in it, Kevin. Oh yeah. 
The julep <laughs> encrusted. Yeah. 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 Um, with, right. With, well, uh, Andrew, real quick, uh, motor wise, um, you said you want to decentralize like everyone going in one place to source. Is there still a viable? There's nothing in the states that's going to do motors other than our, than borrowing from Hoyt. And yeah, I mean the Hoyt KDE. Um, I'm not set on going to them. There are a couple other options. I kind of want to do. I feel like this might split some people's opinion on this, but the gear drive that I have in mind has some motor considerations that would probably almost require a specific type of motor. Um, I also am likely going with a much larger can motor than Good, 63 millimeter because uh, it's supposed to be a mountain board and I want to be able to run nine inch tires on it. So, um, there, the motors are probably just not going to be anything that has been used in eSkate before is a good way to put it. Uh, I'm looking at some other options. They're going to be a bit more expensive, but they're going to be a lot longer lasting. If a one time buy, I don't know if there's any such thing as a one time <laughs> buy with there these, is. but if you give, if you give the customer easily obtainable bearings, links to where to buy them and or yeah. the Amazon click. Or, or if you buy a design that's actually built to be maintenance as opposed to something that is... I mean, in the higher-end drone industry, that's a reality. So, um, But yeah, I, I, think, I think the goal here is more of a integrated gear drive. Um, one of the other things that I'm likely going to... Uh, do is have an external encoder on these that's built into the gear drive system. So rather than uh, strictly relying upon Hall Effect, uh, which is a little bit more fragile, you can get an industrial uh, like IP68 sealed uh, sensor for those. So likely going to be making some changes that will require a very specific custom type of motor, but it's the type of motor that we could easily source and distribute or something so so yeah um guys we're at two hours <laughs> so we should probably wrap it up um but no this is fun. This is really my phone's my phone's at two percent so let's call it right here Almost <laughs> ending. i was just making jokes but uh thanks for coming everyone this was awesome we should um we'll probably do these picking up on pace as we start getting more and more hardware out. Right now, we've just sort of kind of gained our feet after the Robogachi launch, it feels like. All of our, all you know, our first batch of hardware is just about built out. I think Renee has a couple parts left, but that's it. And then, uh, yeah, we're we're jumping right into remotes, but I, I've been having fun with these and I feel like they're a good way to kind of have round table. So you guys kind of have an idea of what we're doing and also gain input and feedback as we go. So thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, I'm glad we started yeah. doing it on the weekends. Oh yeah. I think we'll keep them on the weekends. Right on. Well, we'll Thank see you in the next one. Excellent. Hey, thanks. Guys. Good one, guys. Yeah, good night, yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, see you. See you later. See you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Yep. Thanks, Andrew. Bye. Yep. See you, Mooch. <laughs>